Finally, Ju, Hanjang, and the others reached Nanbu Town, one of the four station areas within the burial site. During their journey, Ju saw a fight between two martial artists of rank 6 battling a white, rank 7 mutated one-horned wolf. The wolf attacked one of the martial artists, but he swiftly leaped and unleashed a powerful attack, defeating the beast. Ju was astonished and wondered how they accomplished such a feat without using star power. Upon arriving at the entrance of Nanbu Town, Ju muttered to himself about how the burial area was more complex than he had expected. Aoju, one of the martial artists from the Tripod Company, expressed surprise, asking if this was just a station area, considering its size was almost comparable to Titan City's standards. As they entered the town, Ju couldn't help but think that he had underestimated the scale of the burial area. He thought it would be smaller compared to Titan City, but it appeared that his assumptions were off. Shi Han, excited, asked her leader, Han Zheng, if they could reach the burial area today. Han Zheng reassured the group that they had no need to rush in anymore and informed them that he would show them new things along the way. Later on, Han Zheng led them to the location of the airships, which they needed to reach the burial area. Shi Han was especially thrilled because it was her first time seeing airships. They joined the line to purchase their tickets and soon boarded one of the airships. While on board, Chu mentioned to Aoju that he had heard that these airships were not unique to Nanbu Town. Other station areas also had many of them. Aoju nodded in agreement and added that the ticket prices were quite expensive. He continued, pondering how large the burial area must be if the station area itself was this vast. As the airship began to ascend, Shihan couldn't contain her excitement and exclaimed, It's flying. It's flying. She reached out to touch Xu and asked him if this was what it felt like to soar through the air, and if he had ever experienced it before. Her enthusiasm didn't leave room for him to answer in the midst of her excitement. While they were in the air, Shihan excitedly urged everyone to admire the beautiful scenery of the white clouds surrounding them. Xu agreed that it was indeed pretty but couldn't help expressing his concern. He wondered what would happen if this type of flying vehicle encountered a mutated beast. Just then, the pilot who was steering the airship informed them that a group of flying beasts had appeared, and they were of rank 5. The martial artists on the airship quickly ascended to the rooftop to confront these creatures. Chu couldn't resist making a comment about how his timing seemed impeccable. As the beasts closed in, one of the martial artists reloaded his crossbow with a peculiar metal container and took aim. When he fired, the container released a metal net that ensnared and killed the beasts that got caught in it. The remaining flying beasts, witnessing this, flew away, putting an end to the crisis. Zhu was surprised at how swiftly the situation was resolved and finally understood why the Rank 6 martial artists were able to defeat the Rank 7 beast. The secret lay in these unusual medals. Later on, while the martial artist who had defeated the flying beasts on the airship was standing, Zhu approached him and offered a cigarette as a token of gratitude for saving them. The martial artist graciously accepted the cigarette and thanked Zhu in return. Curious about the metal net used to fend off the beasts, Zhu inquired about it. The martial artist noted that Zhu seemed to be new to the burial area and mentioned that he hailed from Titan City. However, when Zhu mentioned Titan City, the martial artist appeared ignorant, considering it to be a small place. The martial artist then picked up his crossbow and revealed that the metal net was not a secret, it was made from a type of complex metal. He explained that they had only started extracting this complex metal a year ago, and it came in varying strengths. Even the weakest variants were far stronger than previous metals. They categorized them based on a standard called penetration value, which indicated their ability to pierce through defenses. The higher the penetration value, the more damage it could inflict, and naturally, the price would be higher. The martial artist shared that the metal net he had used earlier had an 8 penetration value, which was equivalent to the entire profit of their current expedition. This revelation left Ju shocked. However, the martial artist reassured him, patting him on the back, and mentioned that he had flown many times without encountering such a situation, so the airship company was sure to make a profit. Zhu returned to his seat and shared what the martial artist had told him with Ao Zhu. Ao Zhu questioned whether they were like frogs in a well, implying that having complex metal could make hunting and leveling much easier. Zhu replied with uncertainty, but then he began to contemplate. He realized that penetration weapons needed to match the martial artist's power. For instance, a rank 1 martial artist could use, at most, a 2 penetration value complex metal. With a smile, Zhu continued, saying that with such a penetration weapon, he could become even stronger. Shi Han then expressed her curiosity about why this place was called the burial area. As they neared their destination, Han Zheng told her they would find out soon and suggested they investigate later. Half an hour later, they arrived at the burial area, and Zhu was shocked to see the massive bones of larger beasts strewn about. He wondered what kind of wild beast horde had led to such a buildup of bones. The pilot then informed them that they had reached the burial area. Upon their arrival at Area 11, where the Triumph Hotel was located, they were greeted by beautiful women. Ao Zhu was pleased, Zhu remained composed, but Shi Han was upset. Han Zheng handed each of them a card representing a room in the hotel. Zhu quickly took his card, stating that he needed some rest. At that moment, the women surrounded him and offered a massage service, but Zhu politely declined. Meanwhile, Shi Han was irritated and blamed Han Zheng for choosing this hotel. Later, Zhu took a shower and began observing the city from his room. 
he pondered how he lacked knowledge and likened it to playing a game where everything had to restart when changing maps. With an eerie smile, he reflected on the surprise of complex metal and anticipated even more surprises in the burial area. With a laugh, he declared, Burial area, here I come. The next day, Han Zheng and his companion informed Zhu Zheng and Ao Zhu that they were going to handle matters related to beast egg hatch and business. They bid farewell for the moment. After their departure, Zhu Zheng asked Ao Zhu to stay and assist him with matters related to Titan City. Ao Zhu assured him not to worry, as he would protect their friends and family while he was around. Zhu then decided to explore the local stores. He remarked that the business atmosphere here couldn't be compared to Titan City. He entered a store managed by an old man and inquired about the cost of a burial area map. The old man replied that it would cost one high-rank white crystal. Zhu promptly handed over the crystal, taking advantage of the situation. The old man informed Zhu that they also had more advanced electronic maps. These electronic maps were more detailed, of higher quality than paper maps, and even had a 3D mode, along with diagrams of various mutated beasts. He showed the electronic map to Zhu and mentioned that it was reasonably priced at one high-rank blue crystal. Zhu was impressed and decided to purchase it, noting that it was indeed more convenient than traditional paper maps. Afterwards, Zhu headed to the street and hailed a passing carriage. The carriage driver asked him where he wanted to go, and Zhu requested to be taken to Equipment Street in Area 9. Upon his arrival, Zhu entered one of the equipment stores. The girl in charge there explained that their weapons all had clear-coded prices and offered to show him their selection. Zhu's attention was drawn to a dagger, and he asked the girl how they checked its penetration value. She demonstrated by placing a small device on the dagger, which displayed the weapon's conductivity and penetration value. The dagger had a conductivity of 27% and a penetration value of 5. Zhu took the dagger in his hands and contemplated the fact that even a dagger with just a penetration value of 5 already cost 1.5 high-rank purple crystals. He thanked the girl and said he would explore other options. Six hours later, Zhu had not managed to find an affordable weapon with a suitable penetration value. He thought to himself that as expected, penetration value weapons all seemed to cost at least one purple crystal. His savings from Titan City seemed to only make him a medium-class spender in the burial area. Then, he noticed an auction house in front of him and decided to enter. The auctioneer informed the audience that the last item for the day was their best product. He revealed a complex metal, 10 centimeters in diameter and 2 centimeters thick. The participants' expectations initially rose, but many were disappointed as the complex metal was too small for their purposes. Zhu, however, thought that its size should be sufficient to make a dagger. The auctioneer then disclosed the complex metal's penetration value, which was 11. While the highest known penetration value was 13, only two units lower, Zhu was taken aback. He hesitated but decided to bid for it. The starting bid was one high-rank purple crystal, and the bidding continued until it reached 6.5 high-rank purple crystals. The auctioneer began counting down and asked if there were any higher bids. Zhu raised his hand and bid 6.6 .6 high-rank purple crystals. In the end, Zhu successfully acquired the complex metal. He examined the metal and a mysterious man nearby commented that in all his years as a crafter, he had rarely seen an 11 penetration value metal. He expressed regret that it was small, as its price could have been much higher. Zhu asked if it was enough to craft a dagger, and the crafter introduced himself as Luo Tian Shan, stating that for him, it was more than enough. Later, Zhu visited Luo Tian's store, where they discussed crafting the dagger. After half an hour, Luo Tian successfully crafted the dagger and shared his experience, assuring Zhu that the conductivity wouldn't be less than 20%. Zhu took the dagger, infused it with his star power, and then used a small device to check its penetration value and conductivity. He remarked, let's see whether you're a dragon or a worm. Upon viewing the stats of his new dagger, Zhu felt immense happiness and satisfaction. Afterwards, Zhu bid farewell to Liu Tian. Liu Tian instructed his worker to clean up the store over the next few days. When the worker inquired why, Liu Tian confidently replied that it was their lucky day, and this time, he was certain he would attain the nine-star crafter title. Zhu then headed to the airship area to return to the hotel. Inside the airship, he couldn't contain his excitement about his new powerful dagger. The next day in Saibu town, Zhu strolled around with his backpack, exploring the area. He realized the tablet he had obtained was proving its worth, not only for finding hunting spots but also for marking interesting stores. While using his tablet, he noticed a flywing equipment store and immediately remembered Wai Heng, the person who had been hired to eliminate him earlier. Zhu decided to visit the store. Upon arriving at the store, Zhu inquired if anyone was present. The store's manager welcomed him warmly and mentioned that choosing their store was a wise decision. He explained that their store offered various types of flying wings, including gliding types, active thrust types, and portable types. Zhu selected one of them and strapped it onto his back. The manager informed him that this was the highest class item in their store and cost only one low-rank green crystal. Zhu made the purchase and then moved away from the store. With the new penetration dagger in his possession, Zhu retrieved his tablet from his backpack. He aimed to find a suitable location to test out his new dagger. 
Just outside Zaibu Town, two different teams were recruiting martial artists for their hunting missions. The first team was looking for martial artists ranked 5 and above for a mission in Wild Wolf Valley. The second team, on the other hand, was seeking three martial artists ranked 7 and above, and they needed to possess a penetration weapon. Zhu approached the second team and inquired if they were heading to Rhino Plain and if he was a suitable candidate. The recruiter noticed that Zhu was ranked 7 but asked if he had a penetration weapon. Even though Zhu had one, he falsely replied that he did not. The recruiter dismissed him, telling him to go away. Zhu then revealed his second dagger with 47% conductivity and questioned whether a weapon with such conductivity should be considered weak compared to penetration weapons. The recruiter explained that they were hunting iron armor rhinos, and only penetration weapons could penetrate their scales. Zhu persisted and asked for a chance to try, suggesting that they wouldn't know unless they gave him a shot. The recruiter became frustrated, but the team leader intervened and allowed Zhu to join. Two other martial artists also joined the team, and the team leader introduced himself as the leader of the Wolf Fang team. He informed the new recruits that this mission had a reward limit. Next to him was a machine gun, and he instructed the recruits that their job was to draw the attention of the Iron Armor Rhinos, and they would attack from there. He asked if there were any questions and concluded by saying they would set off soon. And so, they commenced their hunting mission. One of the new recruits expressed his excitement, feeling lucky to be a part of the Wolf Fang team. He emphasized the need to perform well, as their rewards would be substantial. Zhu asked if the Wolf Fang team was strong, to which the new recruit replied that Zhu must have just arrived. He explained that the Wolf Fang team was top-notch, evident from the fact that they won't even care about you if you don't have a penetration weapon. Suddenly, a group of six large Fang wolves began chasing them. The team leader immediately opened fire on them with the machine gun. Zhu was impressed as he noticed that each shot from the machine gun was made with complex metal, indicating the team's wealth. The last wolf, the Wolf King, leaped toward Zhu. Inches away from Zhu, he prepared to defend himself. However, a bullet swiftly struck the wolf in the head, killing it. It was one of the new recruits who had made the shot. He remarked, I wonder if this Wolf King's worth the cost of an 8 penetration value bullet. The other new recruit chimed in, mentioning that the Wolf Fang team used penetration value 8 bullets easily, while other teams might not even earn enough to cover the cost of a single bullet after their missions. Upon their arrival at Rhino Plain, they encountered multiple rank 9 iron armor rhinos. The team leader instructed the three new recruits to split into three different directions to attract the rhinos. He emphasized the importance of not attracting more than two rhinos at a time. With the plan in mind, Zhu and the others began their operation. Zhu positioned himself near a tree and fired two arrows from his elf bow at one of the iron armor rhinos to get its attention. Then, he reached into his game's inventory and retrieved his new penetration dagger called Bloodthirst. It had a penetration value of 11 and a conductivity of 53%. Zhu commented, let me test your ability. The rhino Zhu had targeted destroyed the tree he was on. Zhu swiftly leaped into the air and performed a combination of flash and slash skills, landing multiple hits on the iron armor rhino in an instant. The rhino's HP bar immediately dropped to a low point. Zhu remarked, as expected, you never disappoint me. Cutting through an iron armor rhino's scale is like cutting through tofu. Suddenly, two rhinos attacked Zhu from behind, but he easily evaded their attacks. He then returned the dagger to his inventory, stating, the test is done. It's time to do what I came here for. Zhu began sprinting, luring the two rhinos towards him. The team leader remarked on Zhu's impressive speed, and Aguang noted that Zhu Zhang was proving himself. The leader affirmed that his judgment had been correct, and Zhu successfully fulfilled his role by drawing the rhinos toward the team. The leader then instructed Zhu to take a break and leave the rest of the team. While the team faced off against the two rhinos, a member from the Wolf Fang team positioned himself behind Zhu. He loaded his weapon with the penetration value 9 bullet, eager to test it against the rhino's armor. However, when he fired the bullet at the rhino, it simply bounced off. The frustrated man commented that gunpowder alone couldn't fully harness the power of a penetration value 9 bullet, and he considered it a wasted shot. Zhu asked if the leaders and others' weapon penetrations should be above 9. The man revealed that this was their first time at Rhino Plain since acquiring the new penetration value 9 weapons. Judging from the situation, even with a penetration value of 9, it would still be challenging to battle the Iron Armor Rhinos. After some time, they finally managed to defeat the Rhinos. The leader emphasized the importance of having good weapons before embarking on a hunt, especially for such significant missions. He then told Zhu that later, he would need to provide his guild card so they could transfer the money after selling the materials at Saibu Town. Zhu was puzzled and asked if the burial area had guild cards. The leader confirmed that they did, and Zhu admitted that he hadn't made one yet. Later, the Wolf Fang team accompanied Zhu back to Zaibu Town. At the Martial Artist Guild branch, Zhu learned about the guild's level descriptions in the burial area. There were five levels, with level 1 being the top level. Members would automatically upgrade to the next level once they reached 10 stars. Inside the guild, an assistant helped Zhu create his member card. After a while, Zhu received his card, which was a white card with 7 stars due to his recent mission with the Wolf Fang team. Zhu contemplated that he needed to do more in the burial area to raise his rank. 
Subsequently, Zhu and the Fang team were on the road when Zhu decided to bid them farewell. He summoned his armored cow and set off for his next destination. Passersby were impressed to see Zhu with an armored cow as his tamed beast. Zhu returned to Rhino Plain, where he leaped from his armored cow. Utilizing his star power and wielding his bloodthirst dagger, he executed a skill called Boomerang Catapult, defeating multiple iron armor rhinos. Close to Zhu, an old man observed him using binoculars. This elderly man was the clan leader and wore a star ring monocle. He was accompanied by Chief Instructor Lao Lai. He asked Lao Lai to take a look at the interesting individual. As Lao Lai used binoculars to observe Zhu, he commented that despite being so young, Zhu had already trained his macro dodge to a remarkable level. Even though he was only a 7th ranked martial artist, the macro dodge skill, previously mentioned during Zhu's battle with the white monkeys, was a complex passive skill unique to rogues. This skill relied on the body's instinct to dodge opponents' attacks and gradually improved through repeated dodges. However, Shen had a different perspective. He commented that if you observed closely, the young man's combat ability was unusual. He believed that Chu was at least ranked 11 in strength. Lao Lai added that Chu should be as powerful as a rank 10 martial artist, if not stronger. Turning to leader Shen, Lao Lai suggested that if this person continued to grow, he had the potential to become a top-notch martial artist. Shen agreed, saying that they should pay Zhu a visit. So, they made the decision to visit Zhu. As Zhu reached level 62 in his hunting, he commented that it was a good place to hunt, having just leveled up twice and obtained 13 crystals. He pondered whether the rhino's meat was tasty, recalling that the wolf fang team hadn't brought any back last time. Zhu used his inventory to store the rhino's meat and scales, deciding to explore further since it was still early. While venturing through the forest, he suddenly sensed the presence of two individuals behind him. Zhu reacted quickly, attempting to strike the older man with his dagger. However, the older man, Shen, calmly told him to calm down, assuring Zhu that he and his companion, Lao Lai, had no hostile intentions. Zhu asked them who they were, and Shen introduced himself as Shen Junzing, while Lao Lai introduced himself as Lai Chengming. Zhu, unable to determine their ranks due to their high martial artist status, introduced himself in a martial artist manner as Zhu Zheng. Shen used his star ring monocle to check Zhu's rank and stats, discovering that Zhu was only a white rank with seven stars. Shen commented, I see, so you just registered yesterday. No wonder. He then asked Lao Lai for his communication device and told him not to be stingy, promising to repay him later. Shen handed Zhu the communication device, informing him that he had updated Zhu's information on it. Zhu asked what the device was, and Lao Lai explained that it was a satellite communication device with a range covering half a country. He mentioned that only a limited number of people in the burial area had such devices, and Zhu assumed they were salesmen. He expressed his amazement and asked about the cost, mentioning that he might not be able to afford it. Shen told Zhu to accept it as their gift and bid farewell. He also shared his communication code with Zhu. Lao Lai encouraged Zhu to research and learn how to use the device himself. Zhu was a bit confused and commented on the unexpected encounter with these individuals, wondering why he felt a bit apprehensive. After Shen and Lao Lai left, Zhu was busy researching his brand new communication device. He said, wow, this thing is really high tech. I need to dive into some serious research. Just then, Shen called Zhu and reminded him of something important. He said, hey, I forgot to mention that according to your standards, you shouldn't eliminate mutated beasts. Instead, you should try to tame them as sparring partners. With your combat skills, beating up rank 9 opponents must be getting dull. Martial artists should challenge their limits in life and death situations. So, go push yourself further. Shen then hung up. Meanwhile, Lao Lai, who was driving the car, chimed in, I still think the gift you gave him was too extravagant. Shen replied, well, I'm the leader and you're the chief instructor. You need to think ahead, Lao Lai. He's just a solo martial artist who recently joined the martial artist guild. It's clear he doesn't like being told what to do. If I had simply invited him, he'd probably decline. Curious, Lao Lai asked, so, you're saying we should earn his favor first and then invite him to join? Shen nodded and said, exactly. People like him. Once they owe you a favor, it becomes much easier to persuade them. In the future, if we have any missions, he'll feel obliged not to refuse. It's all about strategy. Lao Lai couldn't help but comment, Leader, you're quite cunning. Shen chuckled and replied, Well, you know what they say, this is a well-thought-out plan. The scene shifted back to Zhu, who had put on his wingsuit and stood in front of the Snake Python's Valley. He quickly drank a health potion from his game inventory to gain resistance against poison. He thought to himself, The old man was right, and with determination, he soared through the valley. Soon enough, he encountered the snake pythons. With a confident smile, he said, I need to step up my game. Fast forward half a month, and Zhu had been training diligently in the valley. Three python snakes attacked him simultaneously. He activated his macro dodge ability, effortlessly evading all their strikes. His dodge was so swift that his opponents might have thought he hadn't moved at all. After gracefully avoiding all the python's attacks, he remarked, Finally, Zhu had reached the pinnacle of his macro dodge skill. At the same time, a group of martial artists were nearby, and one of them, a young man, asked, Why are there fighting sounds? Are there martial artists down there? His leader replied, It should be snake pythons fighting among themselves. 
The poison is so thick that even a high-ranking martial artist can't handle it. Just as the young man was about to agree, a hand emerged from the poisonous fog below them. It was Zhu. Both the young man and his leader were stunned. Zhu greeted them with a casual good morning, and the leader returned the greeting. Zhu then mentioned, I have something else to attend to. Goodbye. However, the leader stopped him, sensing something extraordinary about Zhu's aura. He wondered if Xu might be interested in a mission. The young man couldn't believe it, asking his leader if he was crazy to invite an unknown stranger who was only rank 7. Other members chimed in, urging their leader to reconsider, reminding him that they were the 37th ranked team in their burial area and couldn't recruit people so casually. Ignoring the protests, the leader told them to hush, explaining that he had his own plans. Zhu, with a sly grin, interrupted, To be honest, temporary collaborations can be fun once in a while. I know my standards, but a little adventure doesn't hurt. With that, Chu extended his hand, accepting the leader's invitation. Later, after they emerged from the Snake Python's Valley, the leader asked Chu to hand him his communication device so they could share the mission details. Chu retrieved his satellite communication device, leaving the young kid and other team members in awe. Having such a device was incredibly rare in the burial area, with only 60 people possessing one. The leader quietly contemplated, thinking, as expected, my intuition was right. Chu isn't an ordinary individual. Zhu received the mission, which was set in Area C-118. Their objective was to explore this unknown region and document the creatures inhabiting it. The leader explained, Area C-118 is home to Rank 12 beasts, and if luck isn't on our side, we might even encounter Rank 13 creatures. However, the rewards and contributions are substantial. The young kid couldn't hide his frustration and exclaimed, For a seal, that guy sent us on this incredibly dangerous mission. It seems this mission wasn't assigned by the guild but by someone named Fur Seal. The leader, with a hint of regret, admitted, It's my fault, I lost a bet with Fur Seal. Now, I can only ask my brothers to join me in taking this risk. Members of the leader's team tried to console him, reassuring him that it wasn't his fault, and if they succeeded, there would be a substantial reward. Zhu chimed in, saying, Pioneers, I like the sound of this mission. And so, they ventured through the forest on their way to reach Area C-118. Up ahead, they spotted multiple white tigers blocking their path. The young kid remarked, There's no other way to see 118, we have to pass through this beast nest. Xu, however, assured them, There's no need to find another route. I'll divert the attention of these fierce white tigers, and you guys can pass quickly. The team was taken aback by this bold plan, and the leader cautioned Xu not to push himself too hard. Xu reassured him, saying, Don't worry, I'm not foolish enough to seek death. With that, Xu dashed towards the white tigers. The young man asked his leader if Xu would be alright, wondering if he was just showing off. The leader responded, Did you forget where we first encountered him? The young kid recalled, The Python Snake Valley. The leader pointed out, If he wasn't capable, he wouldn't have made it out of there unscathed. Using his stealth ability, Zhu maneuvered through the tigers. Since there were many of them, Zhu retrieved fireworks from his game inventory to divert their attention. As the team watched in amazement, Zhu successfully lured all the tigers away from their path. In the end, the team managed to safely reach the other side of the forest, which was Area C-118. They were all exhausted, and the young kid asked his leader if Xu would be alright. Suddenly, they heard a loud noise that the leader identified as stronger than a rank 12 mutated beast. With a regretful and solemn expression, the leader began to speak, but before he could finish, Xu appeared before them. The entire team was shocked to see Xu return. Confused, Xu asked why they didn't seem happy to see him. The young kid grabbed his hand and said, I'm convinced you must be an expert. The leader patted Zhu on the shoulder and thanked him, acknowledging that his speed and skill surpassed theirs. He then handed Zhu a detection device, explaining that they only needed to complete 60% of the mission. The detection device showed 1% progress since they had more exploring to do. Zhu simply said, let's keep moving. Two days later, they reached the 60% mark, and the mission was officially completed. The team was overjoyed at their successful mission accomplishment. Later, they returned to the front of the martial artist guild branch, where Zhu was rewarded with 8 stars for his successful mission. The leader asked Zhu about his plans for the future, to which Zhu replied, I've been a bit tired lately. I think I'll take a break for a while. Zhu and the leader shook hands, and the leader expressed his desire for future collaborations, saying, Working with you is enjoyable. Zhu agreed, saying, Sure, feel free to contact me anytime. With that, Zhu bid them farewell. Curious, the young kid asked his leader why they hadn't recruited Zhu to join their lightning god team. The leader explained, Our team is too small for an expert like him. If we did that, he might become annoyed. It's better to be friends. He then reminded the team, And don't forget, we have another reward waiting for us. Some time ago, the leader of the Lightning God team had a meeting with Fur Seal, the one who had assigned them the recent mission in Area C-118. Fur Seal expressed his surprise, saying, I never thought you guys would come back alive, let alone complete the mission. The deal had been that if Lehu, the leader of the Lightning God team, succeeded in the mission, he would be granted ownership of the Haiyang building property. As Lei Hu checked the aluminum briefcase that Fur Seal had provided, 
he found three orange stars in the Haiyang building property documents. He confidently told Fur Seal, as I mentioned before, what you owe us, I'm taking back with interest. After Lei Hu left, Fur Seal instructed his servant to investigate who had helped the Lightning God team. The servant promptly retrieved a photo from his pocket and said, Brother Hai, this is what we captured. Only this person accompanied them on that day. When Fur Seal saw the photo, it displayed Ju's picture. Fur Seal nodded in satisfaction, saying, Good, very good. The scene shifted to Ju, who was driving his car on the road. He remarked, I have to say, the only good thing about the apocalypse is that vehicles have become cheap. As Ju drove, a martial artist was perched in a tree, observing him. The martial artist informed others nearby that Zhu Zheng had appeared in the east and seemed to be heading towards the burial area. Further down the road, there was a truck, and behind it was a martial artist carrying a sword. He commented, Brother Hai, referring to Fur Seal, really thinks too highly of this Zhu Zheng. He's just a rank 7 martial artist. Send anyone, and he'll be easily killed. As Zhu continued driving, cars armed with machine guns suddenly appeared in front of him. Zhu noticed the martial artist with the sword commanding the cars to open fire on him. The cars began firing at Zhu's vehicle, and the martial artist with the sword remarked, Such a pity, it's a good car. He raised his hands, ordering the others to cease fire. However, a missile struck them from behind, destroying one of their cars, and a barrage of missiles rained down, creating fires and destroying their vehicles. Zhu was the one launching missiles at his attackers. He taunted, You want to play with me? Then I shall play with you guys. As the fire surrounded them, the martial artists began to flee. Zhu emerged from the flames in front of the martial artist carrying the sword. Zhu warned him, Before I find out who you guys are, I can't die. The martial artist retorted, Then I shall let you die. We are from the Sea Sky Company. You helped Lei Hu make us lose the Hai Yang building's property. Now you know why you should die. It became clear that this group of martial artists had been sent by Fur Seal to eliminate Zhu. Zhu recalled Lei Hu's team and the martial artist ordered his friends to attack Zhu. But he skillfully used his macro dodge, taking no damage. The sword-wielding martial artist was shocked, commenting, the macro dodge is something only experts can use. But it was too late to realize that. Zhu unleashed his chasing wind technique with his bloodthirst dagger. With incredible speed, Zhu swiftly defeated three of them. With a confident expression, he remarked, Rank 9. So weak. The sword martial artist was stunned by Zhu's power. Zhu then taunted him, asking, Are you disappointed? You prepared so perfectly, yet you can't kill me. Show me your true power, fight like a true martial artist. The sword martial artist lunged at Zhu, but Zhu easily dispatched him with just two strikes and minimal effort. With this victory, Zhu reached level 70 and unlocked a new skill, Bokeh Two Daggers. This skill caused two times the damage, with the first strike having a 300% increase in attack power, and the second strike having a 200% increase. It also had additional damage of 1000 with a bleeding effect and a cooldown of 1 minute. After dealing with all the hostiles, Zhu summoned his armored cow and continued on his way along the road. He decided to call the Lightning God team's leader, Lei Hu, and expressed his concerns about how the situation had been handled. Lei Hu, sounding puzzled, asked, What's the matter? Zhu then recounted what had happened. Upon hearing the details, Lei Hu exclaimed, Fur Seal sent people to find you. Where are you? I'll send help right away. Zhu responded with a chuckle, You're being too loud. It's fine, I can handle it. Despite Zhu already handling the situation, Lei Hu added, He's very despicable. Be careful of a person called Lin Hao Tian. Zhu acknowledged that he had heard that name before. Before ending the call, Lei Hu invited Zhu, saying, When you're free, come to the Haiyang building. As the call concluded, the young kid from the team approached Lei Hu's room to inform him of something troubling. Lei Hu asked, What is it? I thought you were the only one left in your family. Who else passed away? The young kid replied with somber news, revealing that Lin Hao Tian and others had all been killed in a single attack. Lei Hu was horrified upon hearing this, realizing that Zhu Zhang was indeed a formidable force. He declared, I'm befriending him no matter what. Meanwhile, Zhu was lounging on the back of his armored cow while the cow grazed on the grass. He mused to himself, Sometimes, relaxing and enjoying the sun is not a bad idea. I wonder how Lan Tsai and Su Yun are doing. Then, he thought of Ding Shihan, and his face turned red. He scolded himself, Why am I thinking about her? It's definitely just a work friendship. Suddenly, someone called out to Zhu from behind. When he turned around, he saw that it was Shihan calling him. Zhu couldn't help but wonder, I thought of Shihan, and she appeared. Shihan wasn't alone, she was accompanied by a group of beast tamers. Zhu extended his hand to help her onto the armored cow, and Shihan greeted the cow, saying, Cow, we meet again. Curious, Zhu asked her why she was there. Shihan explained, I'm learning from the Beast Tamer Association's advisor. The taming techniques here are much better than in Titan City. Advisor Kin, one of the Beast Tamers, noticed Zhu and asked one of his men to provide information about him from the Martial Artist Guild. When Kin received the information, he saw that Zhu was a rank 7 martial artist with blue rank 8 stars. 
He sneered, such trash wants to compete with me for this girl. His subordinate chimed in, you're absolutely right, advisor. You're so cool. Kin made a veiled threat towards Zhu, saying, you better know your place or I'll make you disappear forever. Zhu asked Shihan if that uncle was with her, and she confirmed that he was the Beast Tamer Association's vice president and her advisor. She added, he's very kind. Zhu muttered to himself, kind, but his eyes are full of hostility, like he wants to kill me a hundred times. When the Beast Tamers called for Shihan, she told them she was coming. Before leaving, Zhu asked her for her contact number, and she gave it to him. Zhu bid her farewell, saying, fighting. Shihan replied, I will. As Zhu departed, Advisor Kin was clearly displeased with the situation, and the members of the Beast Tamer group couldn't help but ask Shihan questions about her connection with Zhu. They inquired if she was her boyfriend and commented on his wealthy choice of an iron-armored cow as a mount. Kin, in particular, was left upset by the encounter. Zhu arrived at the Haiyang building's property where Lei Hu's team had established their residence. He casually informed Lei that he had come to play. The young kid was visibly surprised to see Zhu's armored cow as his mount. Zhu playfully asked, I came as promised. Any gift for me? Lei Hu replied with a smile, of course, and handed Zhu the document for the Haiyang building's property. With a grin, Lei told Zhu, starting today, you're the owner of the Haiyang building. Zhu was initially shocked but quickly broke into a smile, saying, then I shall accept this gift. Lei then led Zhu inside to show him around. As they entered, all the servants gathered to welcome Lei Hu. Manager Zhu approached Lei Hu and inquired about their distinguished guest. Lei Hu introduced Zhu Zheng as their new boss. The entire staff welcomed Zhu with warm greetings, addressing him as Boss Zhu. Zhu couldn't help but notice the familiarity of the situation, suggesting that the position of boss had changed frequently. He addressed the staff, saying, No matter how many times the boss changes, from today onwards, I will set the rules. Zhu then announced a salary increase of two layers for everyone, which was met with gratitude and thanks from the staff. Approaching manager Zhu, Zhu entrusted him with the future management of the place. He offered his contact number, saying, If you encounter anything, you can call me. Zhu handed over his number, and as he left with Lei Hu, manager Zhu pondered the significance of Zhu's ten-digit number. He thought, it's a symbol for experts in the burial area. Our new boss. Just who is he? Later on, at the top of the Haiyang building, Zhu was leisurely sipping on his juice while wearing sunglasses, just enjoying the relaxation. He commented to himself, this is the true way to relax. However, his communication device suddenly started ringing. Zhu removed his sunglasses and answered the call with a cheerful, hello, this is Zhu Zhang speaking. It was Shihan on the other end of the line, and Zhu greeted her with, oh, you came back. Shihan confirmed, yeah, I just arrived, and then asked if he was free to pick her up from the Beast Tamer Association. Zhu readily agreed to come and pick her up. Advisor Kin approached Shihan and inquired about her activity. She replied, I'm chatting with my friend. Kin complimented her progress, saying, you've improved a lot today. In the near future, you can definitely master other skills. Shihan thanked him for the encouragement. Kin attempted to strike a cool pose and suggested, to celebrate your improvement, I'll treat you to a meal. However, Shihan declined, explaining that she was meeting a friend. This refusal infuriated Kin. Meanwhile, Kin's team members pointed in another direction, where a girl was blushing. It was clear that someone special had arrived, Zhu, wearing a suit and descending from the sky using his flying wings. He held a bouquet of red flowers and landed gracefully. With a romantic gesture, Zhu presented the red flowers to Shihan, leaving advisor Kin utterly stunned. Zhu teased Kin, saying, isn't this Vice President Kin? It appeared that the two men were vying for Shihan's affection. In response, Kin raised his middle finger to Zhu and muttered, kid, if you can't pay for the bill, tell Shihan to call me. Shihan was confused by Kin's behavior and asked Zhu if she had caused any trouble for him. Zhu took Shihan with him to his Haiyang building, where they were warmly greeted by the servants. Shihan asked if Zhu had rented the entire building, but he corrected her, saying, No, accurately speaking, this Haiyang building is mine. After a while, they found themselves sitting at a table, toasting with their drinks. Zhu, with a nervous expression, confessed, Actually, this place has a lot of good wine, but I don't know much about it. Shihan admitted, Me too, I don't know much about wine. They began to drink, and as the evening wore on, Zhu became progressively more intoxicated. He called out Shihan's name and then, with some effort, stood up and tried to say something. However, the effects of the alcohol caught up with him, and he collapsed to the ground, blacking out. As Zhu was fading into unconsciousness, he managed to finish his sentence, asking Shihan if she could stay behind and become the female owner of the building. With a smile, Shihan called him an idiot and told him, if I didn't like you, who would come here to drink wine at night? The next morning, in front of the Beast Tamer Association, everyone greeted Shihan warmly. One of them asked why she seemed so happy and if something good had happened. With a beautiful smile, she replied, yes. Meanwhile, Zhu had just woken up, feeling the effects of the previous night's drinking. He commented, yesterday, I drank too much. I remember I told Shihan something. As he looked around, he found a message left by Shihan that read, okay. It was then that he recalled he had asked her to stay behind and become the female owner of the building. He couldn't help but wonder why he had said that. His communication device began ringing, and it was a call from Shen Junhang. 
Zhu immediately went to the rumored weapon department to meet Chen. The assistant informed Chen of Zhu's arrival, and Chen wasted no time in getting to the point. Shen remarked, I heard you're not the owner of the Haiyang building. Zhu replied, Brother Shen, you gather information quickly. Don't tell me you're also interested in the Haiyang building. Shen, with a serious expression, explained, The Haiyang building is only a small profit for us. To survive in the burial area, one must climb higher to obtain higher authority. He then asked Zhu if he believed he was capable of doing so now. Shen began explaining that in each survival area, there existed a range of authorities. Given Zhu's current identity, protecting his assets would be a challenge. Zhu acknowledged this fact. Shen then handed him an A-rank card, suggesting that the Burial Area Martial Artist Association's A-rank authority should suffice. Zhu wasn't thrilled with the rank of the authority. In response, Shen showed Zhu the various ranks within the authorities on his communication device, cautioning him not to be too greedy. He assured Zhu that the A-rank authority he was offering was the highest he could provide. Shen further explained that from that day onwards, Zhu's information wouldn't be accessible through the Martial Artist Association but would be transferred to a server that required an S-rank authority to access. Upon checking his communication device, Zhu found that he had indeed obtained the A-rank authority, with the code A-77. Shen congratulated Zhu, patting his shoulder and highlighting that this was now his authority code. He added that all A-rank martial artists would receive this information. Shen also noted that Zhu was not only the youngest but also the lowest-ranked martial artist to possess a rank authority. Zhu expressed his gratitude to Shen for granting him the A-rank authority. However, Shen intervened, reminding him of the mission they had discussed earlier. He mentioned that their seventh team had a member who was injured, leading Zhu to wonder if this was part of Shen's plan. In essence, Shen had devised this entire strategy to give Zhu a rank authority to assist Shen's seventh team in their mission. As Zhu prepared to leave, a mysterious man called Shen and questioned whether it was worth it. Shen confidently responded, Big brother, I trust my judgment. As Zhu left the area, Shen commented to himself, You need to work hard and make a name for yourself, or else I'll become a laughingstock. As Zhu made his way to the seventh team's location, which was the Mountain River Hotel in Area 11, he checked his communication device and remarked to himself, I just got the courage to confess, and it seems like I'll be away for some time. Meanwhile, in room 603 of the Mountain River Hotel, the leader of the seventh team and his three members were gathered, preparing for their mission. The leader informed them that they had 20 minutes before departure. The man carrying a rocket launcher questioned who Zhu Zheng was, and the leader explained that he was a rank 7 martial artist sent by headquarters to replace Lao Guo. The man with glasses speculated that Zhu might be someone who relied on connections to join, and the man with the shield declared that if Zhu's combat ability didn't match their standards, he'd kick him out. The leader attempted to check Zhu's information, but with his B-rank authority, he couldn't access it since Zhu had a rank authority. He commented that B-rank authority couldn't retrieve Zhu's information, suggesting that Zhu might indeed have used connections to get in. Just as they were discussing this, Zhu entered the room and introduced himself as Zhu Zheng, there to report for duty. The man carrying the rocket launcher questioned Zhu's seriousness, given his appearance and short-range weapons. Zhu explained that he hadn't found a suitable armor yet, as his previous one had been destroyed while he was in the Snake Python's Valley. The leader intervened, noting that time was running out, and asked them to lend Zhu a spare set of armor. The man with glasses handed Zhu a set, and Zhu thanked him. In response, the man with glasses told him no need to thank me and just not to be a burden during the mission. The team embarked on their journey toward the airship to reach their mission area. People in the vicinity started discussing the team, recognizing them as the seventh-ranked team in the burial area, known for its elite members who were typically ranked at 12 or higher. However, they couldn't help but notice that Zhu was only ranked 7, leading them to assume he might be a lower-ranking member or even just a worker within the team. The team's leader advised Zhu to disregard the gossip, reassuring him that being part of the 7th-ranked team meant he was strong enough to belong there. Zhu expressed his confidence and mentioned that he wouldn't let the comments affect him. As they reached the location of the airship, the leader speculated that the higher-ups might have taken their feelings into account when assigning Zhu to their team. He mentioned that it was just a C-rank mission, emphasizing that it was a good opportunity for Zhu Zheng to adapt and integrate into their team. The man with the shield playfully commented on how the higher-ups seemed to be looking out for Zhu, and the man with glasses chimed in with a laugh, assuring Zhu that there was no need to be anxious because he was there to support him. The leader reiterated that it was merely a C-rank exploration mission, describing it as an easy task for their team. Zhu silently mused to himself, another one, indicating his curiosity about the mission. While aboard the airship en route to their mission area, the team's leader took the opportunity to brief Zhu on their team's role as a force regiment, similar to a SWAT team. He explained that their responsibilities were broad and extended to enforcing the burial ground ordinances. They had the authority to intervene in various situations within the burial ground. The leader went on to clarify their mission, which included dealing with large-scale mutated beast gatherings, dispersing them, and preventing them from forming into beast hordes. He mentioned that everyone on the team would be equipped with a communication device. They had about an hour until they reached their destination area.
In the midst of this conversation, the leader handed Ju a unique communication device in the shape of a watch. Ju found it unfamiliar, realizing that it must be a specially designed item. Suddenly, one of the team members reported an ongoing situation ahead. The member handed binoculars to the leader to get a closer look. Through the binoculars, the leader observed three martial artists surrounded by a formidable rank 10 war bone white tiger. Puzzled, he wondered why such a powerful beast had appeared in this area. The three martial artists seemed helpless, but then their team's airship arrived on the scene, prompting one of them to exclaim that it was the patrol team. The rocket launcher wielding team member leaped from the airship and instructed Ju to watch closely. As he landed, the man tried to engage the white tiger. He fired rockets at the creature, but to his astonishment, it didn't even leave a scratch on the beast. Seeing this, the leader called for Zhu Zhang and offered him the chance to try his hand against the war bone white tiger. He assured Zhu that it was okay if he couldn't defeat it, but it was an opportunity for personal growth. The man with the shield inquired about the danger of the situation, to which the leader responded that if Zhu couldn't handle this, he wouldn't be fit for their team, and the leader would request headquarters to remove him. As the monster lunged at Zhu, he began to think about how to break through its rank 10 defense. He realized that only his bloodthirst dagger could do the job, and he also considered that his peerless dagger might become obsolete after this mission. With confidence, he decided that he, as an expert with a rank authority, couldn't tolerate being underestimated. He was determined to show everyone his skills. Zhu swiftly moved towards the tiger, delivering a powerful strike that stunned the beast. He then leaped into the air, performing a double slash that killed the tiger. With the threat eliminated, Zhu confidently reported to the leader that the problem was solved. The entire team was shocked by Zhu's incredible display of strength. The leader couldn't help but think that Zhu Zhang was exceptionally strong, perhaps even considered extraordinarily powerful. After they rescued the stranded martial artists, they returned to the airship. The leader approached Zhu, apologized for underestimating him earlier, and acknowledged that he was indeed strong enough to be a valuable member of their team. The man with the shield retracted his previous statement about Zhu using connections and instead acknowledged that the weapon department didn't rely on connections. He expressed his amazement that Zhu, despite being only rank 7, possessed the strength of a rank 10 martial artist. He recognized Zhu's potential and labeled him as a genius. The team's leader, Zai, decided that Team 7 would wholeheartedly support Zhu Zhang's growth. He sought the team's opinion on the matter and everyone unanimously agreed with the proposal. Zhu humbly thanked them for their trust and support. As they continued their journey, the ship's captain informed them that they were entering Mission Area Territory A201. Zai, the leader instructed everyone to prepare themselves as they were about to begin their mission. As they made their way through the forest, Zai informed the team that they were in Area A200, known as the Public Shepherd Forest. After a while, they expected to reach Area 201. The man with the rocket launcher mentioned that this forest had a rather vulgar name, to which the man with glasses explained that it was because Team 3's leader, Fatty Jin, hailed from Shepherd Town, and he tended to name areas after his hometown. Zhu remarked that Leader Jin must be a nostalgic person, to which the man with glasses humorously commented that he lacked culture. However, Zai noticed something unusual. He pointed out that according to their knowledge, the public Shepherd Forest should be the territory of forest monkeys. Yet, they hadn't encountered any of them so far. The glasses man suggested that it might be better this way. However, just as he spoke, a shot was fired at him from behind. Luckily, the man with the shield quickly defended him. They realized it was an ambush by the forest monkeys and grouped up to face the monkeys together. After some time, the man with the rocket launcher began aggressively firing at the monkeys, causing them to scatter. Zai noted that Chen Hao, the rocket launcher man, had used too much ammo and advised him to be more careful. Zhu couldn't help but appreciate their excellent teamwork. The man with glasses climbed a tree and reported a situation up ahead. He informed them that there were traces of poison zombies in the wasteland near the city town they were approaching. As they moved forward, they encountered a massive poison zombie roaming the area. They took cover beneath nearby buildings, and Zhu asked Zai if they should attack. Zai, however, cautioned that this situation was even more dangerous than facing a rank 13 mutated beast. He decided they should change their path instead. They continued on a different route and eventually stopped to rest. Zai recorded in his communication device that Area A201 was marked as a red alert area due to the presence of a 6-meter ranked poison zombie. Meanwhile, the man with the shield was scavenging and discovered a fresh purple light fruit, known for its ability-enhancing properties. He handed it to Zhu, suggesting that Zhu should consume it since it could increase his rank. Zhu expressed his gratitude and accepted the fruit, realizing that it was quite valuable, worth many purple crystals. He felt touched that they regarded him as a true brother. The man with glasses returned after scouting the area and reported finding a cave up ahead. He suspected it might be a nest of snake-type mutated beasts. Zai considered this challenge, and Zhu, with confidence, proposed to take it on. He asked the leader why not let him handle it. The team arrived in front of the snake's cave, and Zai warned Zhu about the difficulty of dealing with snake-type mutated beasts, emphasizing the danger of entering. However, Zhu reassured him, explaining that he had spent a whole month in Snake Python Valley before and gained valuable experience in handling snake-type beasts. 
This revelation surprised the other team members. Sai cautioned Zhu not to push himself too hard and handed him a detection device. With confidence, Zhu ventured deeper into the cave, using his stealth skill. Suddenly, a dragon snake appeared, and its rank was unknown. Zhu wondered if his stealth state could be detected and if the snake's sense of smell was exceptionally sharp. Despite using stealth, the snake managed to detect Zhu and struck the ground. Zhu quickly exited stealth mode and dashed backward. Then, he used his skill flash to close the distance and followed it up with a stun skill to immobilize the snake. Outside the cave, Zai informed the team that their fifth member, Zhu, was doing an incredible job. The exploration rate had reached 60%, and they decided to wait for him to come out before returning. Zhu emerged from the cave and urgently told them to run. They started running, and the snake pursued them. Chen Hao asked Zhu which beast he had provoked to cause such a commotion. As they fled, they realized that Zhu's speed was significantly faster than theirs. After returning to the ruined city, Zai asked Zhu about the monster he had provoked. Zhu replied that it was a dragon snake with an unknown rank. Chen Hao, while smoking, commented that dragon snakes were ranked 15 beasts according to martial artists, and they were lucky to have survived the encounter. The glasses man also remarked that they were fortunate nothing worse had happened and that their mission was now completed. Zai then suggested that since they had finished exploring the area, they should let Zhu have the naming authority for this place. He asked Zhu what name he would give to the area. Zhu proposed naming it Dragon Snake Cave to remind other martial artists of their encounter. The team was satisfied with the name, and Zai proposed that Zhu could stay behind to train nearby, which Zhu agreed to. Meanwhile, in the burial area, at the top of the martial artist guild, an airship was being loaded with resources by martial artists. Among them, there was a trader who secretly contacted a mysterious man. The trader informed the mysterious man that tomorrow morning at 7.30, the fly, the sixth cargo airship, would be departing. The mysterious man then contacted his men and instructed them to obtain the contents of the airship by any means necessary. The following morning at 7.30 a.m., the captain and his crew were busy delivering the resources from the airship. They commented on the good weather and expected a smooth shipment for the day. Unbeknownst to them, the mysterious men were secretly following the shipment. Liu Zilong, equipped with flying wings, assured his friend that they wouldn't escape from him. He launched his flying wings, ready to chase down the airship. The airship's captain informed everyone that after completing the mission, he would treat them all to a meal that night. The crew members were excited to hear this news. Suddenly, Zai Long appeared next to them. The team didn't realize that he was there to rob them and greeted him, thinking he was just passing by. However, Zai Long threw explosive blades at them, causing the airship to catch fire. Meanwhile, Chu was in the middle of his training while Zai's team watched him. The glasses man was impressed by Zhu's strength, as he had destroyed a rank 9 spiked armor with a single strike. Suddenly, an emergency call reached Zai. After answering the call, he immediately informed the team that there was a situation and ordered them to stop the hunt. They quickly made their way to the airship. Zai explained that they had received news that the 6 cargo airship had been attacked, and their patrol team was the nearest one available. Headquarters requested them to provide reinforcement. Chen Hao expressed frustration, wondering what those people inside the airship were doing and why they couldn't defend against beasts. Zai clarified that it wasn't beasts but humans who had attacked the airship. As the airship descended, Zai Long called his other friends, telling them that he would leave the airship to them and go stop Team 7's members. Moments later, as Zhu was riding his motorcycle with Team 7, Zai Long suddenly appeared above them and hurled his explosive blades at them. Zhu quickly abandoned the motorcycle and dashed to evade the attack, warning his teammates as well. Unfortunately, due to the limited space, they couldn't completely dodge the explosive blades in time. A massive explosion erupted, but Zhu managed to survive thanks to his quick thinking. He had changed his equipment by directly accessing items from the system's inventory, which saved him from what would have been a fatal blast. However, all of Zhu's equipment had been damaged by Xilong's blades. He commented on how terrifying the blade's penetration was and then asked if everyone else was okay. Fortunately, the shield man had shielded his teammates with his protective barrier, preventing them from sustaining severe injuries. Zai Long, with a sinister laugh, taunted them about his gift before flying away. When Zhu and Team 7 finally reached the airship, it was already too late. The thieves had looted all the supplies, set fire to the airship, and killed the captain and his crew. Zai reported the robbery to headquarters, estimating that more than half an hour had passed since the incident. Zhu was shocked to see that everyone aboard the airship was dead, and his expression turned somber. The shield man tried to console him, explaining that such tragedies often occurred in the burial area, and they couldn't always prevent them. He encouraged Zhu not to take it too much to heart. Later, Zhu returned to his high young building and took a refreshing shower. As he settled into his chair, he examined the armor that had barely protected him from Zai Long's deadly blades. Zhu found himself reflecting on his experiences in countless life and death battles. Each time, he had relied on his instincts and wits to narrowly escape death. However, he also acknowledged that he wasn't always courageous enough to take big risks, as he knew that in reality, death wasn't something he could simply respond from, like in a game. The following morning, Ju decided to explore the number 9 area in search of a new and more suitable armor for himself. 
Fortunately, as he was contemplating his options, a nearby girl announced that the Guo Hai auction was about to commence. She mentioned that the auction's highlight would be a product from the Meteorite Company. Intrigued by the prospect of valuable items, Zhu made up his mind to attend the auction, thinking that it might have some excellent finds. Once inside the auction house, Zhu watched as the auctioneer energetically struck the gavel to announce the sale of a war blade with a penetration of 10 and a conductivity of 31%. It was sold to the participant who had bid nine high-rank purple crystals. Zhu couldn't help but marvel at the prices in the burial area. Nine high-rank purple crystals here would barely buy a single item, whereas in Titan City, it might secure everything in the entire auction. The auctioneer swiftly moved on to the next item, a mutated vine of unknown use. It was discovered near the nest of a rank 12 fire cloud beast, and the auctioneer emphasized that unknown implied the item's value might exceed expectations. The starting bid was set at just one medium purple crystal. As Zhu observed this hatching vine, he suddenly recalled seeing it before. It was when he had gone to steal a dragon egg for the Beast King Union, and these vines had surrounded the eggs. Realization struck, and Zhu thought to himself, hatching. I remember the Beast King Union also searched for a hatching vine to hatch a dragon egg. He checked his inventory and confirmed he still had a dragon egg. Excitement welled up in him as he considered the possibility of hatching the egg and gaining a flying beast. Without hesitation, Zhu raised his hand and bid two medium-rank purple crystals for the hatching vine. The auctioneer called for other bids, but no one else raised their hand. The auctioneer concluded that something as mysterious as the hatching vine couldn't command a high price, and Zhu emerged as the winning bidder for the valuable item. After acquiring the hatching vine, Zhu proceeded to pay the two medium crystals. As he did, he overheard two men conversing about an ancient sword that had been brought in and placed in storage number one. They mentioned that it would be auctioned off tomorrow. The man holding a cigar cautioned his companion to be discreet and not reveal any information. Then he asked HSI companion to keep an eye on things while he went to the restroom. Seizing the opportunity, Ju followed the man into the restroom. Swiftly and quietly, he confronted the man, brandishing his dagger. Ju demanded to know who had brought the hatching vine to the auction. The man nervously responded, recalling that a small martial artist had brought it. Moments later, Ju and the man who had provided the information arrived where the martial artist had been seated. Zhu referred to the man as Shorty, but the man retorted that Zhu wasn't much taller. As a token of gratitude and to ensure the man's silence, Zhu handed him a purple crystal. With this, Zhu approached the martial artist and inquired about the location of the hatching vines. The martial artist noticed Zhu's satellite communication device and questioned why a rank 7 martial artist possessed such technology. Zhu, with a mischievous grin, claimed he had stolen it and dared the martial artist to believe him. The martial artist proposed a deal. He would reveal the hatching vine's location if Xu could tell him its use. Xu, not one to back down from a challenge, decided to share the information he had overheard during the auction. He divulged that the hatching vine could be found near the first cloud beast's nest and assured the martial artist that he could invest the time to locate it. The martial artist, still seeking more, implored Zhu to offer something additional in return for his assistance. In response, Zhu countered by offering the martial artist the benefit of having a friend like him. He made it clear that choosing not to cooperate would result in making Zhu an enemy instead. Meanwhile, Shihan was accompanied by advisor Kin and his team, riding a massive elephant they had tamed. While they were on their journey, Zhu called Shihan. Upon hearing his voice, Shihan's cheeks turned a rosy hue as she told Zhu that she would eagerly await his return. After Shihan ended her call with Chu, advisor Kin couldn't resist asking her about it. He playfully remarked, So, how did it go? You should give me some face this time, right? How about having a meal together later? Shihan, with a polite tone, responded, I'm sorry, but I already have a boyfriend. Kin persisted, asking if it was the same guy from their previous encounter, to which Shihan explained, Yes, we were just friends not too long ago. Though Kin was clearly disappointed, he mumbled to himself about missing out on such a wonderful girl, and wondered why Shihan had chosen someone he considered to be inferior. Returning to Zhu, who was at the guild in front of a computer, he couldn't help but wonder, this girl. Don't tell me she missed me right away after I called her. Shaking off those thoughts, he refocused on the computer and selected 20 hatching vines for purchase, thinking, even though I'm planning to find one myself, having an extra won't hurt. Suddenly, two martial artists behind Zhu began discussing the incident involving the number 6 airship and how 11 experts from the armed force department had taken down a rank 15 mutated beast. Zhu, overhearing their conversation, realized, even though I belong to the armed force department, I'm not as well informed as these outsiders. Deciding to learn more, Zhu stepped out to search for the hatching vines. He also decided to call Shen and discuss the number 6 airship's incident. Shen assured him that he would handle it, but Zhu insisted on discussing the stolen materials from the airship. Before ending the call, he asked Shen to keep him in the loop for such opportunities in the future. Shen explained that he hadn't informed Zhu earlier because the threat, a rank 15 mutated beast, exceeded what Zhu could handle. 
as Zhu walked toward the entrance of the next area, a guard attempted to stop him, explaining that the passage was only open to martial artists with B rank or higher authority. Ignoring the guard, Zhu confidently placed his communication device on the scanner, causing the gate to open, much to the guard's surprise. Zhu boarded an airship headed for the next area, designated as C-152. While on the journey, he couldn't help but praise Hu Yang's capabilities, saying to himself, Hu Yang is so capable, daring to venture into places like this alone. Hu Yang, the martial artist Zhu had previously encountered, was the one who had brought the hatching vine to the auction. Summoning his loyal armored cow, Zhu jokingly called it stupid and said, let's go. As they advanced into the area, they encountered a desolate landscape of sand and ruins. In front of them lay the broken canyon of C-152. Suddenly, a mutated scorpion emerged from the sand, blocking Zhu's path. He cautioned his stupid cow to stay back, explaining, these are red armored poison scorpions, all rank 11. You can't handle them. Summoning his dagger, Zhu executed a flash and stun combo, incapacitating the scorpion and swiftly dispatching it. He collected a purple crystal and some scorpion poison from the creature, pondering the potential uses of the poison on other beasts. As other scorpions closed in, Zhu activated his stealth mode, disappearing from their sight. Meanwhile, Hu Yang was concealed nearby, silently observing. He mused, that kid should come here. I'm sure my eyes were right. However, he suddenly realized that his meat bag had disappeared. To his surprise, Zhu appeared before him, holding the missing meat bag. With a grin, Zhu asked, are you looking for this? Zhu and Hu Yang pressed forward until they reached a set of ruined buildings resembling a fortress. These structures were entwined with hatching vines. Hu Yang proposed a trade to Zhu, offering his help in luring the few fire cloud beasts ahead in exchange for information about the purpose of the mutated vines. Zhu inquired if Hu Yang also knew the vines were called hatching vines, to which Hu Yang confirmed. Zhu then questioned why something with such a straightforward name needed complex explanations. Realizing the simplicity of it, Hu Yang pointed out that the vines were used to hatch beast eggs. He soon regretted making the trade, as the information didn't benefit him. However, he upheld his promise and readied his gun. With determination, he dashed forward, drawing the fire cloud beast's attention. The beasts went into a frenzy, giving chase to Hu Yang. Meanwhile, Zhu ventured into the beast's nest and began digging up the hatching vines that covered the eggs. After some effort, he managed to obtain six fire cloud beast's eggs. Using his inventory system, he stored the eggs safely. Returning to the surface, Zhu met up with Hu Yang, who inquired about the hatching vines. Zhu fibbed, telling him he hadn't started digging because you forgot to lure one of the beasts. And so the fire cloud beast had already returned before I could dig in. As they conversed, the fire cloud beasts grew increasingly agitated, emitting loud cries. Hu Yang questioned why they were so furious, suspecting Zhu had done something to their nest. Zhu admitted to his curiosity and confessed that he had destroyed their eggs. With no loot to show for their efforts, Zhu suggested they explore a different area, and they ventured deeper into the region. Facing another ruined building, this time teeming with more fire cloud beasts, Hu Yang was overcome with fear. He questioned Zhu's intentions, asking if he wanted him to die. He believed that the scale of this nest was unlike any normal fire cloud beast. Zhu speculated if it could be the cloud beast king. But Hu Yang explained that the beast king resided in the sand dunes, not here. Zhu then wondered if Hu Yang lived in this area since he seemed so familiar with it. But Hu Yang quickly dismissed the notion, stating he wasn't crazy enough to do so. Reluctantly, Hu Yang stepped forward to lure the beasts, all the while expressing his regret at befriending Zhu. He considered it his worst choice and vowed not to attempt it again, even if this endeavor failed. Aware that using a gun would draw all the beasts to him and result in his demise, Hu Yang taunted the nearby beasts to chase after him. As he led them on a wild chase, Zhu took the opportunity to steal the eggs and collect the hatching vines. After a while, with all the beasts in a furious frenzy, Zhu assured Hu Yang with a smile that this time he had successfully obtained a hatching vine. Hu Yang, still bewildered by the beasts' madness, questioned why they were so agitated. In response, Zhu opened his inventory system and revealed that he had conducted a bit of research on the eggs. Hu Yang was shocked by Zhu's resourcefulness and called him an absurd pretender. Hu Yang turned to Zhu and said, since you've got what you wanted, can we leave now? Zhu replied, wouldn't it be dull if we left right away? Don't you want to cultivate here? Hu Yang urged him, quit joking around. This place has rank 12 flying beasts, and with our rank, we don't stand a chance against them. Zhu came up with an idea and proposed, let's make a bet. If I can kill a flying beast, you continue to be my bait. But if I fail, you can boss me around. Hu Yang, surprised to see Zhu munching on meat from his bag, asked, when did you take my bag again? Zhu brushed it off, saying, forget about the meat jerky. So, do you want to bet or not? Hu Yang agreed to the bet and remarked, I don't believe you can do it. There's no way you have magic. If you die, don't blame me. Zhu then leaped into the air, facing the fire cloud beast, using the flash stun combo again. He managed to knock it out, leaving Hu Yang stunned. What's going on? You hit it, and the beast is knocked out. While the beast was stunned, Zhu took out some scorpion poison and fed it to the creature. The beast initially reacted strangely, then collapsed and died. Zhu realized he didn't gain experience points for killing it. 
He pointed out, seems like this method of killing the enemy isn't acknowledged by the system. Approaching Hu Yang, Zhu asked, how is it? Hu Yang responded, I won't bet with you ever again. If I do, I'll change my surname. He then inquired, what did you feed it? Ji replied, red scorpion's poison. Hu Yang was amazed and admitted, why didn't I think of that before? I just need to knock it out first. Before Hu Yang could finish, he realized something and asked, how did you even knock it out? Zhu's response was cryptic, well, I can only say, only I can do it. Now, fulfill the bet, quickly. Let's get to work. Later on, Zhu and Hu Yang decided to employ the same strategy again. While Hu Yang played the bait, Zhu ventured towards the nest to steal the eggs and search for hatching vines. Nearby, a leader and his team were watching them. One of the team members asked their leader, why are these two risking their lives to dig up these vines? The leader responded, since we need to pass by here, let's go over and see. Suddenly, Zhu's communication device started ringing, signaling danger. As he took out his device, he spotted four people approaching him. Zhu immediately contacted Hu Yang, who had been chased by the beast, and informed him to shake off the fire cloud beast and return because someone was approaching. In a matter of moments, Hu Yang rejoined Zhu, and the leader and his team members closed in on them. One of the members suggested to their leader, there's a rank 12 and one rank 7. Why aren't we? Before he could finish, the leader intervened, saying, those two guys aren't simple. Fighting them won't benefit us. Hu Yang asked Zhu if they should prepare for a fight. But Zhu advised him to stay calm, as these newcomers didn't seem to have hostile intentions. The leader, Ding Hong, approached Zhu and introduced himself. He assured them, we don't have any bad intentions. Using his star power, Zhu cloaked himself in a strong aura of killing intent and asked, so why did you guys seek me out? The members of Ding Hong were terrified by Zhu's aura, and the member who had contemplated attacking Zhu and Hu Yang silently thanked his luck that he didn't act recklessly earlier. Ding Hong continued, I just want to ask, are you interested in hunting in the C-157 area? There's a rank 13 black client. Zhu's excitement soared upon hearing this offer, 